us begin. And I want to begin, for, so welcome to the second lecture on Maimonides oh, right. and yeah, his life and teaching. And I want to begin, first of all, um, talking a little bit more about Maimonides' life as a religious authority. Uh, and I want to make an, an important distinction that he was not technically a judge in the religious courts. Uh, the judge, known as the Dayan, was the person who actually handled the day-to-day -day court cases in, in, that was before them. Um, he was more of what you might call a higher religious authority who was consulted by judges um, as for larger legal opinions in which he would then provide broad principles and answers. And that's the way he functioned his whole time there. Uh, when he, and this was separate from the times that he was the official head of the Jewish community. The official head of the Jewish community was, in fact, the kind of liaison between the Jewish community and the Islamic government, and also was sort of involved with broad governance issues like taxation and things like that for the Jewish community. It was a position that was sort of democratic, democratically um, uh, appointed and that the Islamic government would consult with Jewish notables who would propose candidates and then they would pick it. Um, the term, there was no official term and um, the heads of the Jewish community, the Rosh, could be replaced uh, depending upon uh, political intrigue, um, bribery uh, of the Islamic officials, and change of government. And that's exactly what occurred during Maimonides' lifetime, as I mentioned, that there was a change in the dynasties uh, ruling Egypt from a, a Shiite dynasty to a Sunni dynasty. Um, and Maimonides managed to uh, be throughout all those, so he Early, uh, fairly early on in his tenure or his stay in Egypt, he was the head for a couple of years, and then he dropped out, um, or rather he was not appoint, reappointed. Um, and another family, a ma uh, there was one particular family that had pretty well held the post for a long time, they held it. And then later on in life, actually fairly late in his life, he became the head again. What happened was that after his death, the position then passed to his son, and then to his grandson, and then to his great-grandson. So the family held the position after his de death for three more generations. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that as a religious authority, are you taping this, by the way? Good. Um, as a religious authority, he was responsible for the writing of hundreds of responsa, responsa. Uh, what are called shelot uchuvot, which literally means uh, questions and answers. Um, he, we, we know of 500 responsa that he wrote um, beginning when he first ar pretty much arrived in Egypt. Um, the first one that we actually have is dated from 1167, which is only a year after his arrival. Um, and uh, they continued until uh, the ones that we can date till 1204, which is the year of his death. So that's a huge number of responsa, responsa, and it was a well-established um, form of Jewish uh, legal literature. There are tens of thousands of them dating from the uh, Goanic period until this very day. Uh, many of the early responsa are not, uh, have never been published or translated, but Maimonides' were. What usually happened was they would collect uh, his responsa in small groups and then they would be bound into larger books and then those books would be preserved. So we actually have a fair number of his that were preserved long after his death and eventually printed and published, but in addition to which there were many more that were found in the Cairo Geniza that we didn't even know about. What's also interesting is, is that uh, we often found the drafts of his responsa in the Cairo Geniza. Uh, in other words, the rough drafts before they were copied out by a scribe and officially promulgated. What happened was that he would get the, the, a letter from an inquirer. He would often write his rough draft on the letter itself, in the margins or on the back. Then a scribe would rewrite it, and that would be the part. The other interesting thing is, is that these um, uh, inquiries came from all over the Jewish world, uh, including from Christian Europe especially from southern France and from Spain and places like that. 
Uh, one of the things that's, that, that's so fascinating is, is that, you know, you might ask the question, why were so many letters and documents found in the Cairo Geniza? Well, one of the reasons is, is that Cairo was kind of like the central post office for the entire uh, trade uh, uh, between the Mediterranean and the, and, and the East, meaning eastern provinces of the Muslim Empire as well as India and places like that. So letters often arrived in Egypt. They were often copied uh, and then sent on. Uh, so that's the reason why so many of these things have survived. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I have so much writing in my money's own hand. Yes, Sam? As head of the community, is the name oligarch comparable to that? Or? No, not really, because he had, a, he had a council that he consulted with of Jewish notables and people who were part of his... He kind of had his own academy, so to speak, right? His own collective. And by the way, all these things are, were also found in the Islamic world, exactly the same kinds of, of structures. And in fact, in order to, um, very often, he would get some of his scholarly colleagues to co-sign the responsa, to show that they agreed with him, which showed that it was a consensus, and that it also built its authority. And he often tried to get consensus on many issues, particularly uh, contentious ones. Um, and these responses cover all areas of common life. And what's very interesting is to, is to compare some of the issues in the responsa to what he says in his law code to the Mishnah Torah. And sometimes he's a lot more lenient in his actual decisions over particular court cases than he is in this bald statement of the law in the Mishnah Torah. And he was very, very sensitive. And I want to give you one example that I picked out because I thought the cantor would be particularly interested in this. Uh, and this was a case regarding a cantor. Uh -huh. um, uh, and um, it was apparently uh, a, not a problem that was unknown during his lifetime. Uh, let me just find you the part of the text. Apparently, it was a problem um, with cantors that they in occasionally got drunk. <laughs> um, it, it was, it was a problem. problem. Um, as a matter of fact, in a Mediterranean society, Goitain's great book, Volume 2, which deals with the community, has a whole section on cantors. It's quite fascinating. Uh, cantors were uh, usually kind of itinerant uh, performers. Uh, they would go to different communities. They were not only responsible for chanting the prayers and services, but also to sing at communal events, at weddings and funerals. And some of them became quite wealthy and quite well-known. Some of them were also really great scholars. And they were also composers of liturgical poems. Um, but apparently, um, uh, there was actually... He, this is what Goitain says. The cantors of the Geniza period... In other words, he... he can't, uh, uh, Goitain compares them to operatic virtuosos. He says, The cantors of the Geniza period had another trait in common with opera singers of later times. Not a few of them manifested a certain predilection for the bottle. <laughs> okay? Uh, a query addressed to Maimonides complains of a group of intoxicated cantors who, while singing on the platform in honor of a boy reading the section from the prophets, namely his bar mitzvah, filled the synagogue with giggle, giggles and raucous shouts. <laughs> now, another one um, that Kramer quotes is so what that... Was, um, what was my mother's response to that? Well, I'm going to tell you. Um, <laughs> there was a, another one who drank to the point of intoxication and behaved improperly. When he entered the synagogue late and found somebody else had taken his place because he had shown up late, he would object that his replacement intervened between God and the congregation. While he was drunk, he carried a Torah scroll on one of the holidays and threw it down, breaking one of its ornaments. Mm. When the congregation, what he had asked, he had uh, done, he replied in his inebriated state, what is a Torah scroll anyway? So, um, since this man had done this several times, the congregation asked Maimonides where it was permissible for the man to be a chazan, to carry a Torah scroll, or to perform any of these services, and they asked what... They, sh he should, they, they should do about it. And this is what he, after going on, this is the basic answer. It is in no way permissible to allow someone of the sort to be a chazan or a shaliyah tzibor, as it technically called, or a carry a Torah scroll. And whoever prays behind him, certainly whoever supports him or does not seek to depose him, demeans the law 
and is included amongst those who, quote, despise and desecrate the Torah, uh, that's a technical term from the Bible, from the Talmud, who is guaranteed to be himself dishonored by mankind, signed by Moses. So, <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that, Cantor, the dangers of, ver of uh, fame. <laughs> But, um, by the way, the section on Cantor's and Goitein is really interesting because um, uh, it, it's, it's very, you know, he, 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 they were a very important communal uh, functionary. So he, uh, he took time. all the responsa and drew that material from the responsa? Yes. Uh, Kramer quotes that directly from one of the responsa of Maimonides found in the Geniza. So this is, different places? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, um, there are numerous uh, texts in the Geniza about... Uh, functionaries of the community, of which cantors were an important part of it. Okay? Uh, the, he, then after that he goes on to talk about ritual slaughters, uh, shochtim, and so on and so forth. So, um, what, was, what was his method in his decisions in his response? Because this was going to affect the way he uh, wrote his code. Number one, he stated what the Talmudic law was, whether or not he thought it applied in the particular case. Number two, he didn't always um, adhere to the Talmudic law, especially when it conflicted with science and reason. For example, there is a, 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 a category in the Talmud of a woman who has had who was married, her husband died, she remarried, her second husband died. According to Talmudic practice, she is then designated as a killer wife, and she's not allowed to remarry. Okay, And this became a very interesting topic of discussion, because what happens if the husband dies of his own negligence, if uh, he gets lost somewhere on a voyage? In other words, it, he, Maimonides didn't like this, and in effect, he basically eliminated the category because he thought it was a superstition. Good for him. Okay? So here it is, something that was, there's a lot of discussion of this particular issue in Jewish halachic sources in the Middle Ages. He came down on the side of, of science and reason and said, there's no connection between this man's death and this woman. So he allowed a woman to be remarried. Yes, Risa? Did, did the same thing happen <coughs> in the other direction? In other words... Were they killer husbands? No, yeah. no. that's a good point. No, they're not, as and far as I know. Wives. Okay. Wives. Uh, by the way, women probably died more than men because of childbirth. Uh, thirdly, he did not recommend that the law be applied when the conditions needed more flexibility. In other words, he, he, he believed in judicial discretion. Remember, he's giving these opinions to the judges. But these are existing laws. Yes, in, well, existing practices in some cases. I see. Not like a Torah law, but kind of a rabbinic, because it's in the Talmud, it acquires the status of settled law, okay, or uh, local custom. And that's one of the things that he said. He would gave a lot of importance to local custom, even though it undermined uniform legal practice. There was a tendency by the Gaonim in Babylonia to try to unify practice. And there's always an attempt by legal authorities to try to unify practice. Maimonides was willing to allow local custom to prevail even when uh, there was a difference uh, that could provide uh, diversity in, in uh, legal practice. Um, fifthly, he was willing to give leeway when the law was honored in the breach. In other words, the spirit of the law as opposed to the letter of the law. Um, he, number six, he acted with compassion and did, often did not press the full extent of the law. In other words, he had a lot of what we call in Yiddish rahmanus on the people who came to the court. And lastly, when, when the issues had to do with women, most of his rulings regarding women tended to elevate their status in Jewish law. So, um, one of the things that we can learn from uh, his responsa is his legal terminology, um, uh, his legal method, uh, and it gives a very interesting background to the, um, I want to pass this down. Could you give us an example of number five where he would go with the spiritual and the uh, No, I won't, but the point is if you look in Kramer, he gives you numerous examples of these, of these particular issues, okay? Um, the, um, 
I think there are other copies of the the other. Did you print out the materials, by the way, that I sent by the email yesterday? <coughs> uh, I printed out one. Okay, well, we've, I've got some copies there for you if you want. Um, so let's now get to the Mishnah Torah um, itself. Um, the Mishnah Torah, of course, was his greatest uh, work. Um, it took him, you know, more than five years to, uh, to write it. Uh, the name is taken from Deuteronomy uh, 1718, where Deuteronomy itself is called the Mishnah Torah, meaning repetition or reteaching of the law. But the Mishnah Torah is also called Yad HaChazaka, the strong arm, because the word Yad has a numerical value of 14. And there are 14 books, major uh, books, in the Mishnah Torah. Um, one of the um, amazing things is, is that, there's, that several of the books have survived in an autograph manuscript in Oxford's uh, Bodleian Library. Um, again, collected by some guys in the 16th century from the Middle East. In other words, it is, it is the fair copy of the Mishnah Torah with corrections signed by him. And the signature that I sh gave you is the one that he signed at the bottom of each one of the books. Uh, unfortunately, I thought it was the full manuscript. It's not. It's only uh, part of the Mishnah Torah, but it includes the section of the first book, and it's completely online and digitalized. If you go, if you kind of, if you look up Mishnah Torah manuscript, you will get immediately a link to the Bodleian Library. They have a special site devoted to the Mishnah Torah, so you can actually look at the actual pages, page by page, if you want, and it includes the introduct is introduction. Uh, by the way. Um, there's also um, part uh, uh, existing of his commentary on the Mishnah. Um, uh, four, five out of the four or five out of the six original books, again written by him, are in existence in different libraries. And the reason why it's they survived is is that his family preserved it as a almost a sacred object for generations. Um, what's interesting is, is that um, because there were conf uh, sometimes contradictions between his earlier commentary on the Mishnah and the Mishnah Torah, he would go back and he revised the manuscript, even though it was a fair copy. He sometimes crossed out whole paragraphs. Um, and then even after his death, um, his son and grandson would also make notations so that it became a living document. Um, it was passed down in his family for generations. At some point in the 16th century, it was sold. Uh, one of his descendants took it to Aleppo, Syria. That's where it ended up, where it was venerated as a sacred object. But somehow it came into private hands, probably in the, six, in the 16th century. Um, in the 17th century, um, two manuscript collectors who were basically creating the, uh, the library at Oxford, uh, or filling it up with Hebrew manuscripts, uh, independently on two different trips, bought four out of the six volumes of this, his commentary in the Mishnah, this particular one. And then later on in the 18th century, a member of the Sassoon family, which was an ancient Jewish family from Iraq that had migrated to England and were very, very wealthy. Um, they, they were you know, considered the Rothschild's nouveau riche since they'd been a wealthy Jewish family since the 10th century. Um, the Sassoon family acquired two volumes of it, which they later uh, after the creation of the National Library in Jerusalem, donated it there. So there are four volume, three volumes in um, uh, in Oxford, and there's two volumes in, in Jerusalem, and I, I think that's correct. And one volume has got lost uh, since there were six. So um, <coughs> he um, he completed the Mishnah Torah in 1178 after he had created what was called the Book of Commandments in Judea, in Judeo-Arabic. Now the Book of Commandments was a list of the 613 commandments. Um, this book was eventually translated into Hebrew. Now, why was it important to establish this list? Well, because he had to do that in order to be able to write about each of the 613 commandments. And secondly, it's not so, it was not established exactly what were the 613 commandments. In other words, in the Middle Ages, there were several such lists from different scholars, 
and they did not always agree on what constituted one of the 613 commandments. Did they now, all agree on 613? Yes, they all agreed on 613, but they didn't always agree on which ones should be included. Now, why is there this confusion? And I'll take a couple of minutes to explain the origin of the 613. The, 613, the number of the 613 commandments, in fact, began life as a rhetorical device in a homily by a, by a, I believe by uh, a, a, a Amoraic Rav from the 4th century, 3rd or 4th century, I'm forgetting offhand, named Rav Simlai, <clears throat> who is known in Talmudic literature as a great um, um, creator of homilies. And we have one of his sermons almost in total, I believe it's in the Talmud, I will email you a copy of it if you wish, in which he begins by saying there are 613 commandments in the Torah, and he says the negative commandments correspond to the days of the solar year and the positive commandments to the bones in the body. Huh. Okay? Now, he then goes on in this homily to say, it's a, it's a fascinating homily because then he breaks it down by saying various biblical figures, in fact, reduce the commandments to fewer and fewer until he comes up with one of the prophets, in effect, says there's only really one commandment that covers everything else. So it's a homily. However, medieval authorities took it literally, and they tried to create these lists of 613. Now, why was this difficult? Because if you were to go through the Torah, I will bet you almost any amount of money you wish that you could not come up with 613 commandments. Because they are not only commandments that are explicitly written in the Torah, and, and again, you might find it difficult even to know what's an explicit commandment, but those by which the rabbis inferred were in the Torah, okay? And so between the two of them, uh, the second category is a little slippery because the rabbis also created what they, was their own legislation. And therefore, there are two basic categories of rabbinic law. There is what's called the mitzvah doraita, which is an explicit or inferred mitzvah from the Torah. And then there is the mitzvah de Rabbanan, the or gezerot Rabbanan, the rabbinic enactments that were on top of these. Okay, and sometimes in later Talmudic discussion, they couldn't tell the difference between one or the other because the rabbinic act, enactment was so old, they weren't sure whether it was to be it was actually a rabbinic enactment or it was a Torah law. So that's why it was necessary to establish a list. And I'll give you one example where Maimonides uh, disagreed with most other authorities who created these lists. There is a mitzvah that if you ask most rabbis, they will say is a mitzvah deraita, is a Torah law, to visit the sick. Now nowhere in the Torah will you find such an explicit law. You will, however, find at the beginning of chapter 18 of the book of Genesis that, my mon that Abraham was visited by God. And the Midrash is, is that, and he was, and when he was visited by God, this is the famous story of God and the angels coming to visit him to announce the birth of Isaac and to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, it says that he was sitting down. So the question in the, the Midrash asks is, why was he sitting down? If God shows up, you should be standing. It's because he was still suffering from the effects of his circumcision, which had occurred in the previous chapter that this was three days after the circumcision when, when he was in the most pain, and therefore God did not require him to stand up. So, in the to it, it, many rabbinic authorities consider the mitzvah, uh, consider it that this is justific, and why did God visit him at that time? To visit the sick. So because God visited the sick, so we should visit the sick. Now, is that a mitzvah doraita or not? Most rabbinic authorities said it was. Maimonides said it was not, but that it was a rabbinic enactment that is to be subsumed under a broader category of something that is a mitzvah. So that's one example where if you look up the list, you will see Maimonides' list disagrees with other lists. By the way, if you're interested in seeing Maimonides' entire list in English, um, it's found in the Encyclopedia Judaica in the article Commandments, 613. The but, but, yeah, but they're still equivalent, right? Whether it's direct, explicit, or... Yes, rabbinic, rabbinic, and according to traditional halakha, yes, the interpreted one are considered as authoritative as, as, as explicit, and rabbinic law is to be followed as if it was 
act uh, a Torah law. Now, one of the interesting things about his list was, indifferent to many of the other lists, is instead of listing them as they show up in the Torah, in the order in which they show up in the Torah, which is the usual way the lists were done and are still done today, <clears throat> he divided them into categories. And he, of course, made distinctions between Torah law and rabbinic law, negative and positive. He distinguished between negative and positive laws, putting, putting the positive and then the negative, and also laws between people and laws between people and God. Now, to give you an example of uh, uh, not his method, um, there are two. Um, this is a modern book on the commandments called the Mitzvot. I don't know if it's still in print. It's a really nice book. And again, this basically gives you the 613 as they show up in the order they are in the Torah. It's a nice book because what he does is he, cause, he has each law, he ex explicates, and he gives you quotes from various commentators and then references as to where he gets it from. Um, so this follows the, the, the non-Maimonidean uh, list of how to do it. And one of the more famous ones in the Middle Ages is the Sefer Chinuch, which uh, it's been translated in English, by the way, um, which uh, is not just a list, but like that is an explication. And again, in the table of contents, it goes by the Parsha. And then it shows you, tell, he tells you the positive. This is from the 14th century. Um, it tells you the positive and then the negative ones with an explication of them. In the earlier part of the Middle Ages, they just gave you a list. They just listed the laws. So that was the first thing that Maimonides did. And by the way, in actually in his introduction, which in our translation they cut out, um, there it, what follows the introduction is, is his list. Okay? Um, so um, that's something that he did, which was quite innovative, by creating categories. And um, what's interesting, of course, is, is that, as you'll see, the categories begin with belief. Um, the Mishnah Torah became the standard for all subsequent legal codes. And there were a number of legal codes that came out in the Middle Ages and later. Some of them were partial codes, just a small part of Jewish law. Um, and they, some of them predated, obviously they're ones that predated Maimonides, but after he wrote the Mishnah Torah, his became the model for all subsequent codes. And there were two in particular that were extremely important that relied on him uh, that became the authoritative codes to this very day. The first was one called the Tour by uh, Jacob ben Asher, who was a Spanish rabbi, um, and he wrote it in the, 13th, in the 14th century. Um, so a century, T, no, T-U-R, it's, uh, the tour is the Arba Turim, the four uh, rows of the, um, uh, of the gems of, uh, of the high priest on his breastplate. Um, and in fact, um, the tour, Jacob and Asher established kind of uh, four major divisions. He, he kind of recategorized things. He didn't follow Maimonides' categorization. Uh, Jacob ben Asher was um, the son of Asher ben Yechiel, who was an Ashkenazic rabbi for Germany, who became the chief rabbi of Toledo, and wrote many, many responsa, and also many commentaries to tractates of the Talmud. Um, Jacob's brother, Judah, became the chief rabbi of Toledo after his father, but Jacob became one of the most important legal scholars uh, of the Middle Ages. Now, in the 16th century, um, Yosef Caro, who was of Spanish descent but living in Turkey, uh, wrote what is called the Shulchan Orach, which again, since the Shulchan Orach, the Shulchan Orach has become sort of the last major code that, um, that has been accepted by the Jewish community uh, since then. He was a Sephardic Jew, but then within his own lifetime, an Ashkenazic rabbi, Moshe Isserlis, wrote kind of Ashkenazic editions. Uh, into the Shulchan Aruch, and when you get a traditional copy of the Shulchan Aruch, it's usually um, uh, it's usually uh, Karo plus Isilis plus other stuff plus commentaries, uh, and all of them are based on basically Maimonides. As I pointed out before, Karo himself was a he was a mis he was a Kabbalist by the way, a very important Kabbalist, but he was a great legal scholar, and before he 
Uh, his greatest activity was, in fact, writing a, a major commentary to the Mishnah Torah as well as to the Torah. Um, so everything after Maimonides, Mishnah Torah was based on the Mishnah Torah, although nobody followed his categorizations uh, the way he did. Um, the language of the Mishnah Torah is interesting. It's not typically medieval Hebrew. If you read Rashi, for example, um, or other medieval scholars from Europe who wrote in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew that's very heavily influenced by Talmudic Aramaic. So if you don't know Talmudic Aramaic, it's not easy to read. Um, on, Maimonides, by contrast, wanted this code to be able to be written by anybody who could read Hebrew. And therefore, he wrote in the same language as the Mishnah. But he extended it. It's extremely concise and lucid. It's, it's a lot more elegant than Mishnaic Hebrew. In fact, it is so important in the history of Hebrew that um, Shai Agnon, the great Israeli uh, um, uh, Nobel Prize winning author, used the Hebrew of the Mishnah Torah. That's the style he used in his own Hebrew writing. And Adnan, of course, uh, is you know from the 1960s. Um, he uh, Maimonides often uses rhetorical questions in 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 the Mishnah, and at the end of the books, he often throws in a bit of lyrical prose. Uh, at the end of the books, the treatises or the chapters, or on some particular topics, when he talks about, for example, the love of God, it's very lyrical. It's not what you would call con uh, legalistic in any ways. Um, anybody have any questions at this point? That 